Here's Rob Dibble. And joining us in studio, Unqua Asonye uh, from WFSB TV Sports. He covers high school, UConn, but basically sports is sports. You're covering pros too. Correct. Whatever they tell Correct. them to go exactly. to. Exactly. And sometimes I break the rules when I can. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So welcome to the show. And for uh, me. I, obviously, um, you, you know, tell people about your day. I mean, when you when you wake up and you start talking about what you're going to cover on any given day, I mean, it, it's different in the in the local sports world on TV. It's totally different. So the first thing I do when I wake up, I try to check the high school schedules. Then I try to check the local college schedules. If Central's playing, if UConn's playing, if there are veils that pop up, and then when I walk in, sometimes I'm by myself. Other times I'm around my colleague. Shout out to Joe <laughs> Zone and Mark Robbins. And then we all sort of put our heads together and figure out, okay. We're building out our show here. We go shoot this, go tape this. Since we write, we produce, we edit everything else so that everything that goes on air is usually the work of our own hands. Sometimes that's great. Other times it's... You know, it's a mixed bag. But uh, well, and a good friend of ours best. is John Pearson over at Channel 8. He you know, and is the best. He is. And and I, listen, I know Kevin Frazier from Cincinnati when I played there. And you guys tell people, because I respect the crap out of you guys, sometimes you've got to film your own stuff. Yes. Sometimes you've got the camera on your shoulder. you got a mic in front of you. You're doing everything. Like you said, you're directing, producing, writing, uh, and you're, re- you're doing the reporting uh, of these events. Right, and, and that is the job now, right? Because when I first <laughs> got to this market, like, I had freelance doing play-by-play radio, but before I got to Connecticut, I hadn't held a camera in over eight years. One of the first things they told me is, all right, so you go ready to shoot your stuff? I said, oh, okay. I, I kid you not, the first time I took a camera out, I went down to the equipment room, I go in my bag, and then I didn't realize, because I was green as all anything, there was no camera in the bag. No, correction, there was a camera in the bag. I'm See, I'm telling the story wrong. That's how bad it is. But... There was no battery in the no bag. No battery. Oh, yeah. So I charged out. Battery. Just like, yeah. Right. I'm just like, this is bad. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, there was a mini handy cam, and I'd sprinted down to a Hartford Athletic game and managed to catch the game-winning goal on camera, then busted it back Whoa. to the station and put it on. So it's a lot of hustling, a lot of bustling. I know I should have maybe thicker skin, but I get so irritated when people walk out. Go, oh, he was only here for thirty minutes and he's leaving already. I'm like, guys, this has to go on the air. You have that busy, baby. I'm moving. I gotta go somewhere else. (laughs) Well, you'll never make that battery mistake ever again. Once you do it once, that's the last time you'll ever do that. One reason is that we wanted you in today is you talk to so many people locally, and one kid that we know is going to have a really big week is Will Levis, quarterback out of Kentucky. Dibs and I did not know he was from Kentucky. Connecticut until probably the end of the last year because we were both high on Kentucky. We were like, right. man, this team finally getting it together. Programs turn it around. They're beating ranked teams. It's not a basketball school anymore. This football program's got something to say about it. And really this quarterback, Will Levis, has been pretty big percentage of their success. Yeah. Now, I went to Xavier All Boys Catholic School here in Connecticut, uh, but you got to talk to him and do a one-on-one interview with this kid. What is he What is he like beyond just being a football player? Well, I know the first thing for those who don't watch him a lot that he went viral for was the whole mayonnaise situation. And even I'm like, you kind of got to walk to the beat of your own drum. Tell everybody about the whole mayonnaise situation. The worst part about it is that was the number one thing I wanted to talk about. And I totally forgot. I don't, uh. remember, what, I don't remember whether it was in milk. It was in ice cream, something like that. Right? He's eating mayonnaise on stuff he shouldn't be eating mayonnaise. And this is how he gets famous. Yeah. But before <laughs> all that, I mean, he had one of the best seasons for a Kentucky quarterback in decades. And when I talked to him about it, he just sort of took it as if I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be able to do this. And one of the things that he said to me, which was interesting because it's right around the time that Jim Moore starts to get his fingerprints on that UConn football program, he says, y'all have no idea how much football talent is in this state. And people are starting to wake up to the fact that there are four stars and five stars that can make it to the NFL. And so I'm just happy for the fact that the state's going to be getting the attention it deserves well and, and a lot of times kids are going to move to other parts of the country too i can't remember the kid that moved from connecticut to la played for one of their big sports teams when i was living out there and then he ended up playing at usc um and it, and it happens all the time because right. you just you don't play enough big time football here you might play it in california arizona texas florida ohio's got some great places pennsylvania Connecticut's not known for high school football. They, they, you know, Ansonia, some of these teams, yes, but they're still small schools. Right. And, you know, and when I was living in Cincinnati, I mean, these kids were 6'6", 300 in high school. 
you know, and they were they were getting ready to go to Notre Dame or Tennessee or whatnot and stuff like that. So explain that. I mean, it's just it, it's not just that it's Connecticut. It's the fact that you need genetically big people to play with. You need big time football players to play with, or else you got to go find them somewhere else. And you also got to give them the support to do so because the kids that are six six so three hundred, yep. they eat. Like they're six six three hundred. That's right. They right. lift like they're six six three hundred. So sometimes, and I can understand with the youth programs and things of that nature, it's really easy to look for skill, like who's the fastest, who's the strongest right now. But as puberty starts to do its thing, whether or not they're in the right place that can develop, and that's why you'll have a lot of some of the prep schools out here. They'll take chances on a kid that looks skinny when he gets to campus. But they'll have a coach that's, like, really into training. They'll have at least food available when they're not running up their parents' overeats for yep. getting food at all hours of the day. But the support's there for them to get better. And so for those who are trying to figure out, you know, how can we better keep athletes here in Connecticut, I think the question really needs to be how do we support them and make sure they're in a place where leaving isn't an option. Like, there's nothing – there needs to be a conversation where there's nothing you can offer me that's better – than what I'm currently receiving. And it's bigger than swag. It's bigger than whatever NIL deals will filter down the high schools because we all know it's coming. Yeah. But it's about making well, and sure it's facilities they can be there. too. I, I right. coached at Oaks Christian out there and their facilities were second to none. They had like Will Smith's kid played there, Joe Montana's kid played there. I, I coached Wayne Gretzky's kid. He played on the football and the baseball team and stuff like that. But the facilities were ridiculous. Right. The facilities, like they basically built the school and the facilities with the families because they wanted their kids to have better stuff. And I mean, and, and that, and that's why it became one. It's one of the bigger. And now it's like a football factory oh, yeah. out there. But I mean, you also have the coaches to back it up. Like Clay Matthews Senior is a, is a, is a coach out there. Uh, other coaches have come in there uh, to help out, and they don't even want to be the head coaches. They just right. want to help coach these kids and get them to another level. Talk about that as well. You need tutelage at at this level to get these kids better. The most underappreciated position in. Any sport, I think, is the any assistant coach on a high school team. Because on the high school, at the high school level, the head coach makes the decisions. The head coach is most likely to jump to a bigger job at a bigger high school, college, or whatever. When people really want to sow into the kids that are there, it makes the biggest difference in the world. And I want to tap into what you said about facilities and stuff like that, right? Because when you have the facilities, but you can't use them, that's also a senseless thing too i mean uh, the ciac i think they just recently got rid of that rule that says kids can't train with their teams in the off season which is a huge disparity thing as well because let's face it if your school is like in an affluent suburb and if you're offended by hearing affluent suburb you live in one <laughs> well but said. if your school is in there that right. means You've got the travel programs. You have the different ways, the way that you can pay money to get your kid better. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But if you're then going to ask kids that are either from Waterbury, from Bridgeport, from Hartford, if you're going to say, oh, well, they can't train with their kids because it's an unfair competitive advantage. Are you going to ask families that are already stretching themselves really thin to get their kids a good education to, again, throw more money into what in essence is? Dibs, you're somebody who was able to play here in this state and go to the highest levels of your profession. I can guarantee that you can name five people that were on your level, but for one reason or another, were not able to get to where you were going. And it's hard to ask a family Absolutely. who's trying to put things together to then throw money in when they could just train with their school. And I'm glad that they're finally going to be able, it seems, to do that. So That's well with, said. with the facilities and all that other sort of stuff, it's important to give, but it's also important to make sure that it's being taken care of correctly, you know, and the kids need to have ownership of stuff like that. too. AJ Dillon, I feel like is this conversation. Yeah. AJ Dillon went to New London High School for his freshman year and then got plucked by Lawrence Academy in Grutton, 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 Grutton yeah, Massachusetts. Grutton. Uh, <laughs> and then look at him now, man. He's one of the most highly sought after running backs and just a beast on Green Bay. And again, another one that we found out after a Monday night football game, I I think this kid's from Connecticut <laughs> and you know, the rest is history with this guy. Um, and I do think that coach Moore jr. And the program getting better in UConn football makes the high school programs better Absolutely. as well. Um, Travis, uh, uh, New Haven, 
defensive tackle just went. Oh, Travis Jones. Travis, Travis Jones. Jones. Travis Thank Jones. you. Travis Jones, to me, is somebody that all these kids need to look at the example and the years that he spent as a high school football player here and then at UConn. And now who knows what's going to happen with the Baltimore Ravens and where he's at. Uh, but Coach Mora has built more than just a winning team in one year. I think he's built a, a football vibe around this community. One guy I wanted to ask you about, because I know you know him a little bit, and just his potential, still got a year of college, Jackson Mitchell coming off an injury. Coach Mora, we just had him on the show. He's super high on him this year. What do you think of his potential next level? I know we still got a whole year to play in college football, but next level, does he fit in the conversation of a draft pick? So I can't wait to answer that question because there's a point about Jim Moore that I really want to make. But um, when it comes to Jackson Mitchell, I'll be honest, as someone who hadn't been that exposed to college football, I'm like, huh, he leads a team in tackles. There's nothing about him that like jumps off the page. Like, yes, he's fast for a linebacker. Yes, he's strong for a linebacker. But it's one of those things watching him that I didn't realize that he made the play until the play was already made. Yeah. And to me, I almost think yeah. that's the best kind of player to be when you're UConn because if he was somebody like a Nathan Carter that immediately had this one skill that you could sort of lean on, then he could be gone. But he's also a local kid, and this means something to him. And I think that also adds to why he should be on everybody's draft board next year, whether it'll be first or second. I mean, he was a semifinals for one of the bigger awards this year as it was. So I think with another year, a stronger schedule, more exposure, I think we're talking late first, early second, at least right now. We'll see what, how it all goes. But I want to talk about Jim Moore real quick because – for those who kind of look at what we do and think, oh, maybe you guys are just being cheerleaders, let's be very clear. It's more fun to cover yeah, Exactly. Team. That's it's what I'm trying to tell everybody around here. It's more fun to cover a team right. that's doing the job well. And with respect to past, you know, administrations and things of that nature, the bar was super low for UConn football. Right. The fact that they brought in a former NFL head coach to begin with was like, oh, uh, okay. Splash. And he was one of the people – and you've been around, so correct me if I'm wrong, but he's one of those people who speaks, and I actually believe what he says. I could feel it in every avail. I could feel it in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I have, I have three people in my phone as witness, I'll be glad to tell you, but it was right before the Fresno State game, which I didn't think that they would win, that I said that UConn football was going to a bowl game. And that is solely because of what he's done for that program. I can't wait to see who else he's bringing in, because as you both know... You can get so much now, but to take that next level that he wants to get to, it's just going to need more and more effort. Unkwa uh, Asonye from WFSB TV Sports. I wanted to ask you about all these guys. My wife's a UConn alum, so she's kind of heartbroken. But uh, let, let's just start with uh, Jordan or even Andre Jackson or Sonogo or Tristan Newton. You, you start with whoever you want. Who do you like the most um, going into the NBA draft from UConn? Oh, are we talking how high they'll get picked or like career potential? Well, like for Hawkins, Hawkins is a great shooter, but he's not the biggest guy in the world. But Sonogo's a giant guy, but he's not the greatest shooter in the world. I mean, you know, the, a lot of these guys have to develop into great NBA players. Yeah, career potential. What you career think? potential. Career potential. Who's got I, the highest, highest ceiling? I'm going to go with Hawkins because there is something about being able to shoot in today's NBA that will never go away. I mean, you will have – it's a little bit different because I know back in the day you could get onto an NBA roster if you were just big and willing to be a little bit mean. In today's NBA, if you can shoot a three-pointer, you will pretty much always have a job. Shoot a three-pointer, know how to pass, move off the ball. And one thing I've liked about Jordan Hawkins is not just his release, but his ability, but his ability I should say, to move off of screens because there are plenty of people who can shoot really well, they can shoot with a contested. They can shoot while it's open. But moving off the ball and being able to create your own space, I think he's going to be great. Sonoga really intrigues me because I was one of those who definitely said, I want to say maybe November, December, I was like, he's got to start going through people in order to get to the next level. Tips and then he did it. <laughs> and all he did in the NCAA tournament was go through, go people. through yep. people. Right. I would have loved to see him operate a little bit more on the perimeter because if he's 6'10", six, 6'11", six, he's a first-rounder and we're not having this conversation. Because he's 6'8", six, 6'9", six, we have to see whether teams will be willing to take a chance on developing the skills. And maybe he has them and we just haven't seen them yet. Andre Jackson. Oh, my goodness. Everybody wants them. I want them on my football teams. 
I just want to understand when someone eventually told him you can run through anybody, take the ball and do it or go over him. I, yeah. Right. And I think he needs to come back so we can see him do that more. Now, he didn't get an agent, so that potential could be there. Um, You and I went back and forth on this topic like two weeks ago as far as where people are potentially supposed to be landing. He's at the bottom of the first round. If that is so, you're still looking at over a million dollars for him per year for the next three. I don't know if NIL is going to get him there. It's always about money, man. It really is. Always. Now, the last guy we haven't really talked about is Tristan Newton. Like this, this was kind of a surprise to all of us in this room. But knowing the talent that's coming in, like the five start, five I shouldn't say stars, the five freshmen that are coming in, two possibly being starting guards, um, the writing might be on the wall as far as playing time for this guy. But still, another one that is one of the few in UConn men's basketball histories with multiple triple doubles. The only one. The only. The right. only one. He, if I thought he had a hell of a tournament. And especially the great uh, back end of this year. But looking at all the draft boards, he is nowhere to be found. Not talked about I at all. everywhere, too. What is the future for Tristan Newton, do you think? So, it's funny. I was up late watching the Timberwolves almost give away the game to the Nuggets. And I kept seeing Nikhil Alexander-Walker out there. And that's actually the it's kind of comp. role that's that I thought comp. that Tristan Newton could right. play. Because the thing about the Timberwolves that would actually make it a perfect fit if they wanted to take a flyer on him, they don't really have a backup point guard. It's Mike Conley, and then maybe if Anthony Edwards does run the show, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, I don't remember if he was drafted as a point guard, but even then, not really. Like, I think yeah. what Tristan Newton gives us is an all-around player. He may not have one of those, oh, my goodness, off-the-charts skills, But the fact that he can do everything at a high level and do it competently, I mean, not for nothing, he scored the most points in the national championship game. I think he needs to come back, too, because my thinking is if there are doubters in front of you now, come back and erase all of it. You don't even have to win another title to do it, but you need to give evaluators, need to give fans, and give everyone else a chance to see from start to finish who you are, and why you need to be at the next level and why teams need to be begging for you next year. I'd also argue, too, Andre can improve his draft status, which would be more money, and, yes. and Tristan obviously could as well, which would be more money in the long run for him. As well. Oh, wait, we got Uh-oh. something. What do you got? The Jets finalized trade for Aaron Rodgers. Oh! Wow! Oh, my God. <laughs> Just changed oh, your broadcast right. tonight. All oh, right, yeah. Sorry about <laughs> well, that. Unquote, high thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I know you're very busy and you're going out to some uh, high school games right now. But thank you so much for stopping and stop in anytime you want. Oh, I will take y'all up on that offer for real. Thank Excellent. you both for having me. It's fantastic, thank you, young man. All right, we'll come back. We'll do the daily pickle. We'll get into some MLB, including the 33-year-old kid that just got called up with the kid. Pirates. Ain't no kid.